Chapter 049 Substitution Time Travel was a hard thing to prove. It was known to be impossible among mags, and proof to the contrary usually boiled down to possession of impossible knowledge and skills. Unfortunately, that often simply wasn't convincing enough. There existed a nigh infinite number of ways to gather information with magic, none of which required time travel, and impossible skills could just as easily mean you were not who you claimed you were. There was little that Zoyan could tell Ksvim that couldn't be explained with something more mundane than time travel. Still, while Zoyan had no idea whether Ksvim was actually going to accept his story, he was confident that the information he'd written down on the sheet of paper in front of him would at least give the man some pause. The restarts varied greatly in how they developed, but some things always remained the same, which meant that Zoyan could give Ksvim a multitude of small predictions about the upcoming days. Things like what was going to be written in the newspapers, what magical stores would announce special sales in preparation for the summer festival and what students would end up leaving the academy because of the monster incursions. It helped that it had been less than a week since the restart had begun, so events didn't have the time to diverge too much yet. Individually, each of the things he'd written were easy to explain. When taken as a whole, he would have to be the best damn spy in the whole city to acquire that kind of information, and it still wouldn't explain how he'd known about some of the more sudden events on the list. He handed the list to Ksvim, who quickly scanned it and then pocketed it with a silent nod. He told Zoyan that he would try to verify his claims over the weekend and that Zoyan should visit him again on Monday. And that was that. A decent outcome, all things considered. Zoyan halfway expected Ksvim to criticize his penmanship and tell him to start over and write properly this time around. He bid Ksvim goodbye and left. He was in the process of walking back home, idly trying to think of a good way to broach the topic of Sudamir's soul well to Kyle, when he spotted a green haired girl waving at him in the distance. Surprised and distracted as he was, it took him several seconds to realize who he was looking at, even though green hair was pretty damn rare and therefore a huge giveaway. It was co Priva Reed, one of his classmates. He waved back uncertainly, wondering what that was about. It was common courtesy to greet your classmates when you meet them outside the academy, of course, but this wasn't the first time Zoyan had encountered co Priva outside the academy and she had never reacted like this in the past. She'd give him a nod if they passed each other by or say hello if he did it first, but never try to attract his attention like she just had. Which made sense, really. She was almost a total stranger to him, just like most of his classmates. So why was she, oh? Never mind, he was going to find out what she wanted soon enough. She was crossing the street and making a beeline towards him. Zoyan studied her as she approached trying to see if he was in some kind of trouble. He felt no hostility or apprehension emanating from her, so probably not, but co Priva always kind of intimidated him. Less so since he got stuck in the time loop before he used to actively avoid her whenever possible but even in his current situation he'd rather not tangle with someone from House Reed. He was still vulnerable to being drugged senseless, and that was kind of their specialty. He clearly wasn't the only one who found her intimidating, either. She was a tall, shapely girl something Zoyan could attest to at the moment, what with her getting ever closer to his position but very few people had tried to court her over the years. Even Benaisk refrained from making a pass on her, which was pretty damn amazing. Zoyan was pretty sure that Akoha was the only other girl in their class who Benizk had never tried to flirt with Zoyan. You can't believe how glad I am to see you here she said once she'd finally gotten close enough. He raised his eyebrows at the statement. You live together with Kyle, right? Yes he confirmed, curious what that had to do with anything good. I agreed to meet with him about a business deal today and he gave me the directions to this Imaya's place where you two live, but... I seem to be misremembering something because I can't find it she said. Could you give me some directions here? I can do better. I'm on my way there myself, so if you don't mind I can just walk you there he said great. I was hoping you would say that she grinned at him. Lead the way, then. 
and don't mention to anyone that I got lost, okay? That was pretty freaking embarrassing, I don't know how I messed up so badly. If Kyle asks, we just, met on the way by accident. Kind of true, anyway. Zoyan nodded in acceptance and they both set off towards Imaya's place. He couldn't help but frown at co Priva slightly, though. Business deal. Was this what he thought it was, unfortunately, co Priva noticed the look and misconstrued its meaning what's that look for, she asked defensively. You don't approve of me coming to your place or something. It's not like that Zoyan assured her hurriedly. Man, she was prickly. It's just that when Kyle told me he was going to find someone to buy those rare alchemical ingredients from, I didn't expect this to be the result. I thought he would go to someone, well, older. When Kyle had told Zoyan that he had to get a hold of a fair amount of normally restricted alchemical ingredients to continue with his research, Zoyan had thought the Morlock would go to some shady shop or something, not try to broker a deal with one of their classmates. Then again, Zoyan had to admit that that the idea wasn't stupid as such. House Reed, of which co Priva was a member, specialized in growing magical plants and processing them into alchemical ingredients. It was also a public secret that they were heavily involved in the sale of drugs and illegal alchemy products in general, and through that maintained deep links with organized crime groups. There was a highly publicized trial against the house a few years back since several smuggling rings were found to be led by exiled members of the house, but nothing came out of it in the end. House Reed was responsible for a sizable proportion of Eldermar's herb fields, greenhouses and forest preserves, some of which nobody except House Reed knew how to tend to, so the government wasn't willing to antagonize them too much. So yes, there was some logic to Kyle approaching co Priva to acquire the needed ingredients, though Zoyan was still very surprised it had worked. He would have expected co Priva to act outraged at the implication that she was engaged in criminal activities, fearing some kind of trick. That's what Zoyan would have done in her place. He would have to ask Kyle how he had done it later, just in case there was some secret to it that he should know about he did intend to make use of criminal networks himself in the near future, after all wait, you're in on that, she asked. Surprised yeah. We're in a partnership of sorts Zoyan said how she said, giving him a speculative look. I would have never guessed you were involved in something like this. You just seem so straight laced, you know. Then again, you're a pretty driven guy, and my grandfather always said that nobody ever got powerful by following the law. Such sage wisdom from the older generation to tell the truth, I would have never guessed you'd be involved in something like this. Either Zoyan said. I mean, weren't you annoyed when Kyle approached you about this? Doesn't it bother you that one of your fellow students automatically assumed you were involved in your family's other business simply because you're part of House Reed? She snorted derisively everyone assumes that anyway she said. They're just too polite to say it out loud. At least most of the time. Besides, I made some uncharitable assumptions about him as well. I wouldn't have acknowledged any random offer, you know. If you had been the one to approach me, I would have told you to go to hell. And possibly punched you, if you didn't back off after that. But since Kyle is a Morlock, I assumed his offer is actually genuine. Morlocks have a reputation of their own, you know, ah. So that's why it had worked so easily. Co Priva then tried to talk him into telling her what he and Kyle needed so much restricted material for and how they had gotten the money to pay for it. Zoyan actually answered the first, saying it was for benign medical research, totally true, unless Kyle was misleading him, but refused to answer questions about the money. He took the chance to ask her if she was planning on reporting them to someone reading her surface thoughts to make sure she was telling the truth. She denied that truthfully, as far as he could tell and seemed more amused than insulted by the accusation. She didn't really believe they wanted the materials for medical research, though. Zoyan didn't bother convincing her he was telling the truth. After that, the conversation shifted to other, more casual topics. Mostly academy-related, as that was a relatively inoffensive subject 
but Copriva sometimes pried into his private life when she saw a convenient opportunity to do so. It was interesting, as she hadn't been this talkative in the previous restarts when she'd joined his combat magic group. Eventually they reached their destination, at which point Copriva met Imaya. His landlord had either never heard of House Reed or had an even better poker face than Zoyan had thought, because she looked positively overjoyed about Copriva's visit. She insisted that Zoyan was rude not to offer Copriva something to eat and drink before dragging her away to hash out a deal food before work Imaya said in a lecturing voice. That's the rule. Since Copriva seemed actually excited at the prospect of eating some homemade cookies, Zoyan went along with it. He wasn't in that much of a hurry. He really shouldn't have been surprised when Copriva asked Imaya for a glass of beer, or when Imaya gave them both a glass in response. He covertly transmuted the liquid into something non alcoholic while they weren't looking, but that just made the stuff taste even viler than it usually did, so he may have shot himself in the foot there. In the end, while the deal was successfully concluded, what was supposed to be a relatively short visit ended up taking most of the afternoon. Copriva even ended up meeting Kirill, with whom she got along surprisingly well he would have to talk to his sister later about what was acceptable for conversation around the green-haired girl, since Copriva said she would drop by again next week to deliver the materials. He should probably have a talk with Imaya as well, just in case the older woman really had no idea who she was dealing with. Ultimately, though, Zoyan did not worry about the whole thing too much. The deal was largely arranged by Kyle, for Kyle, with Zoyan's role being mainly to pay for it all. As such, he felt it was only proper to let the Morlock boy take care of it while Zoyan focused on something else. Gods knew he had too many things vying for his time as it was break. Zoyan's plan for the weekend consisted of two solid days of Arania fighting and accompanying memory reading to practice for the eventual opening of the Matriarch's memory packet. Sadly, the plan didn't survive collision with reality. His first target the burning apex web in the vicinity of Seoria turned out to be a rather poor choice for aggression. They were a martially inclined web, proficient in both magic and mental combat, and had spent most of their existence in fierce competition with the neighboring webs. The patrol he ambushed seemed like easy targets to him, but they ended up being anything but. They worked together flawlessly had some sort of mental attack that could partially pass through his mental barriers and had prepared the battlefield beforehand. They ended up maneuvering him into a pre-existing explosion trap and detonated a boulder right next to him. He managed to shield himself against the bulk of the blast, but he still ended up with a severely wounded arm and a multitude of minor scrapes. Plus he had a raging headache from when he failed to shield against their telepathic attacks properly. He activated his recall stone and fled. The damage was nothing really serious, he later found out, but it would take several days before he was completely healed, even with the healing potions that Kyle was supplying him. Since embarking on further campaigns against the Arania while in less than top form struck him as a terrible idea, his plans would have to be delayed. Damn it. Dot, at least Kyle was happy. Ever since he had found out that Zoyan could teleport all over the country as he pleased, he had been trying to talk Zoyan into taking him to the northern wilderness so he could gather herbs, mushrooms and other materials for his research. Zoyan had been decidedly against it, considering it to be a waste of time, but since his plan was already shot to hell and he couldn't do much at the moment, he figured he would grant Kyle's wish just this once. Accordingly, Sunday found Zoyan wandering around the forest with Kyle. Zoyan had expected his role would be to simply teleport Kyle around and protect him from anything that sought to kill them, but Kyle was feeling talkative that day and insisted on explaining everything he was doing to Zoyan. Every time they encountered one of the plants Kyle was looking for, the Morlock boy told him why the plant could be found in that particular place what it was useful for, and how to harvest the plant correctly. All of which was very important information that was not easy to get a hold of one could not find this sort of thing in most books, as people were reluctant to share this sort of information. It was all too easy to over-harvest specific magical plants if too many people were doing it, 
so there was a tendency among herbalists to guard their secrets tightly and only pass them on to their apprentices. Even so, quite a few magical plants went totally extinct over the centuries due to unchecked exploitation, making potions they were used for impossible to make in modern times. So yes, it was a good thing to know all this. And yet, I still don't see why you wanted to do this so badly Zoyan complained as he used a knife to harvest some sort of river grass. The thing was tricky to harvest correctly, since one had to cut it quickly and in exactly the right place or its alchemical properties would be completely ruined. Not an easy thing to do with one wounded hand. We could have just bought all of this in a store and saved ourselves so much time. Yes, I know it would have been rather expensive but I could afford it. Easily. Money is less of a problem for me than time. I'm afraid you are wrong Kyle said, shaking his head. The Morlock boy was crouching not too far from Zoyan, staring at a large boulder like it was the most interesting thing in the world. Zoyan felt the urge to ask Kyle what the hell was so interesting about that rock, but eventually decided he didn't want to know. The things we are gathering are very hard to find in a store. They tend to be snapped up by wealthy, influential alchemists who buy them straight from the people who gather them in the wild. They never reach the shelves. Really? Zoyan asked, surprised. Strange. You'd think someone would just start cultivating them if they're in such high demand. You know, like House Reed and so many others are already doing for other useful magical plants. Not every plant can be grown in controlled conditions Kyle told him. Many of them cannot survive outside their natural environment for whatever reason, and that environment is either impossible or uneconomical to mimic artificially. Others will grow just fine, but will lose whatever essence makes them useful if not taken care of in just the right way or exposed to very specific conditions. Some of them can be transplanted into gardens and survive but will never grow or reproduce afterwards. Some of them grow so slowly that nobody can be actually bothered to wait for them to grow to maturity. Okay, I get it Zoyan said, interrupting his lecture. Magical plants are very hard to domesticate. I actually knew that already but the ones we are gathering just don't seem all that special to me, you know. But if you say otherwise, I will take your word for it. I'm not a botanical expert by any means. Neither am I, but I do know a few things about the topic. My adoptive mother insisted I had to know these things if I wanted to be a real alchemist Kyle said, rising to his feet and discarding the clump of moss he had been scrutinizing up until a moment ago. Are you done with those? Do you need some help? Here Zoyan said, handing Kyle the river grass he harvested. I think I got all of them correctly but you should probably check to make sure. Kyle glanced at the small bundle in Zoyan's hands and immediately discarded three of the stalks that Zoyan had apparently ruined without realizing it. How Kyle could recognize that on first sight, Zoyan had no idea we're done here, I think Kyle said, looking around for a second. I don't think we'll find anything else here without a lot of walking around. Do you think you can teleport us to the next section of the forest now? Sure. My mana reserves were replenished a while ago Zoyan said let's go then. Deeper into the wilderness this time around. We haven't been attacked by anything truly dangerous the entire day and I want to see if I can find some ghost ivy or moonflowers Kyle said, gesturing northward. Zoyan nodded, unperturbed by the somewhat increased danger. While there were quite a few creatures that could kill them that deep in the forest, he should be able to notice them in time and teleport them to safety. A minute later they popped over to their new destination and Kyle started looking around to assess their surroundings teleporting is so very convenient the white-haired boy commented. I can't wait to learn how to do that. How long do you think it would take me to learn how to teleport like that? I don't know. A year or two. Zoyan speculated. If you work hard on your shaping skills, that is. As little as a couple of months if you work with me to create a training regimen for you like I'm doing for Tyvan. Ha. Huh. I might take you up on that at some point he said. I'm wasting a lot of your time and nerves as it is, 
though, and I don't want to be greedy. You've been a lot of help over the restarts Zoyan assured him. You've earned some consideration from me, as far as I'm concerned. I see Kyle said speculatively. In that case, I'd like to pester you a little about those disappearances happening around Nuzuftvrai. Many of these people had been my friends and acquaintances, and their fate rests rather heavily on my mind. I know you have been busy in these past few restarts, but did you perhaps look into the matter at some point? Well. He hadn't planned on having this talk during this particular outing, but he supposed this was as good a moment as any to tell Kyle about Sudamir's soul trap thingy actually, about that. Break Zoyan had fully expected Kyle to freak out when he heard what Sudamir was doing in his isolated forest mansion, and he was not disappointed in that regard. If anything, Zoyan greatly underestimated how furious the Morlock boy would be by the end of the story. Kyle, in a rather stunning display of recklessness, wanted them to go visit Iasku mansion immediately so he could inspect Sudamir's soul trap. It took almost an hour for Zoyan to convince the other boy that this was a spectacularly bad idea Zoyan was still wounded, Kyle was not thinking straight, and neither of them had done any preparations for such an expedition you realize what this means, right? Kyle asked him. It was apparently a rhetorical question because Kyle immediately answered it himself. Every one of those times you died during the invasion, your soul was likely sucked into that thing along with everyone else's. Yeah, so, asked Zoyan. The time loop mechanism clearly doesn't care about that. It just plucks my soul out of the pillar and goes on to do its thing like usual. Though now that Zoyan thought about it, that in itself might be a clue as to how the time loop really functioned. It could be that the time loop mechanism was just so powerful that it could casually extract his soul out of a giant soul prison that probably had a million safeguards against someone doing that very thing but it could also be that the way it all worked just sort of sidestepped the problem. If the time loop really destroyed everything whenever it rolled back time, it might not really matter where his soul ended up in the end, so long as it's still intact yes, and the collection process is apparently sufficiently benign that you have suffered no soul damage from being exposed to it multiple times Kyle said. That's good to know, at least. It definitely puts some of my fears to rest. But Zoyan, I... I'm honestly not sure how much I can help you with this. When you really get down to it, I'm really just a dabbler in soul magic, and Sudamir is clearly an expert at the field. He has also delved deep into areas of soul magic that I wouldn't have even touched, so even if I were an expert I might not have been of any help. I'll see what I can find out in the next couple of days but in all likelihood you're going to have to find someone else to help you deal with Sudamir. I don't suppose you have any recommendations. Zoyan tried I already gave you a list of people I know who dabbled in soul magic and, well, Sudamir already got most of them Kyle shook his head sadly. Sorry. Maybe try that warrior priest that Lukaf is friends with. He clearly has considerable experience with soul magic and he sounds like he could help. In fact, the priesthood in general might be your best bet. They regularly go after people like Sudamir, and have both the qualified experts and the experience necessary for something like this. I'm pretty sure they won't just dismiss your claims out of hand. They take reports of necromancy very seriously, and your accusations should be easy to prove just teleport someone in the vicinity of Iasku Mansion and let them see the evidence themselves. That's an interesting idea. I might actually try that in the next restart, if you really end up being unable to help me in any way Zoyan said. Though I'm worried about that escalating into something huge and attracting Red Rogue's attention. Sudamir is connected to the invasion pretty tightly, I don't think the Ibasons would stay secret for long if Iasku Mansion came under attack like that. Honestly, that might actually be a good thing Kyle speculated. Red Robe thinks you are part of an army of time travelers out to get him, right? If so, it might actually be suspicious if you don't periodically do something big like that. Well, maybe Zoyan said. But it's still a huge hint to Red Robe, telling him where to look to find out more about his opposition. 
I feel it's too dangerous to expose myself to danger like that. After a while, they ran out of ideas to bounce back between each other and uncomfortable silence descended between them. Kyle's inability to help much against Sudamir clearly kept eating away at him, gradually worsening his mood, and Zoyan didn't know what to say to cheer him up. He doubted Kyle even wanted to be cheered up. Eventually, Kyle decided to simply cut their expedition short and asked Zoyan to teleport them back home. The gathering trip was over, break Monday came, and with it his meeting with Ksvim. Ksvim had never told Zoyan when exactly he should drop by for their talk. So Zoyan decided to come see him once his classes were over and he had no other obligations. Ksvim, as it turned out, had other ideas. The man ended up causing a small stir by barging into Zoyan's first class of the day to pick him up, evidently impatient to talk to him. He had no idea whether this was a good or bad thing, and Ksvim refused to discuss anything until they were safely seated inside his office so Zoyan asked. What's your final verdict? Instead of answering, Ksvim took a palm-sized stone orb out of his drawer and handed it to Zoyan channel some manner into this orb Ksvim told him. The moment Zoyan did so, the stone sphere lit up in a soft yellow glow. That was very familiar to Zoyan. It reminded him of those basic training orbs they were given during their first year at the academy the ones that helped students learn how to reliably channel their manner into the target. What was the point of making him do something like that again, wait, is this thing testing my mana signature? Zoyan asked curiously yes Ksvim confirmed. Everyone's personal mana is unique. You can hide or change your mana signature, but you cannot mimic someone else's to the best of my knowledge. The most you could do is trick the orb into giving a false positive, but I'd be able to tell if you were tampering with it in that fashion. It seems you really are who you claim you are, Mr. Kaczynski. I expected as much, but it would be sloppy not to check. First it was a lock keyed into my mana signature, and now this. How exactly did the Academy acquire my mana signature? I don't remember giving it at any point said Zoyan, handing the orb back to Ksvim every time you used one of these training orbs during your first year said Ksvim waving the stone orb in front of Zoyan's face, you were effectively giving the academy your mana signature. It was just a matter of locking the orb down to preserve it for future use. And that's legal. Zoyan frowned. Ksvim nodded. Required by law, even. The government likes to have everyone's mana signatures on hand for investigations. It greatly simplifies a lot of identity disputes and the like. Right Zoyan sighed. So now that we've established I'm indeed Zoyan Kaczynski, yes, the time loop problem Ksvim said, putting the orb back into his drawer. I assume you are aware of the prevalent opinion regarding time travel. Zoyan nodded they say it's impossible he said. I know. But that's theory and a lot of failed experiments Ksvim interjected and my personal experiences say otherwise continued Zoyan, ignoring Ksvim's interjection. Whatever prevalent opinion says, I can clearly see that time travel is possible. It's just a question of whether I've convinced you I'm telling the truth or not. You've convinced me there is something to your story, at least Ksvim said. But I'm afraid I'm going to need more convincing before I actually accept the idea of a time loop. Do you think you could clarify some things for me? The next hour and a half consisted of Ksvim questioning Zoyan about the rules that governed the time loop and the events surrounding it. The questioning was detailed enough that Ksvim probably realized Zoyan was hiding some things from him, but the man never called him out on this. He also never wrote anything down, simply staring at Zoyan and listening to his explanations in silence. It was honestly all a little unnerving the material world has been cut off from the spiritual realms. Ksvim asked, raising an eyebrow at him. And you didn't feel this merited an inclusion in that list of things you gave me at the end of our Friday meeting? Well, what would that prove? Zoyan defended himself. Nothing about that says specifically time travel. No, but it helps ameliorate one of the major issues that has been bothering me about this scenario Ksvim said, staring at him. Namely, the incredible scale of the event you're describing. 
You've described the time loop as a cosmic phenomenon it doesn't just wrench your soul into the past, it literally rolls back time for everything except you and your fellow time travelers. That's an implausible claim. The universe is very big and magic as we understand it has sharp limitations. But if the time loop had to cut off the material realm from the spiritual sphere to do its work, then that means it is somehow limited in scope, and that makes the whole thing a lot more believable to me. Did you speak to an astronomer to see if there were any irregularities in the stars and planetary orbits? No Zoyan frowned. Why do you think there would be irregularities? Because any responsible spell designer tries to minimize the costs of the spell, regardless of how much mana he has at his disposal Ksvim told him. If I was in charge of building a spell that does what you describe, I wouldn't have bothered extending the effect beyond what I absolutely had to. Why burn resources unnecessarily? No one has ever set foot on the other planets, much less the distant stars. You could simply replace the heavens with an illusionary screen and be done with it. Most people would never know the difference. But astronomers might Zoyan guessed yes. Especially if the spell originates from the time of the first Icosian emperor like you said it might. There were no telescopes back then, and even professional stair watchers relied on their eyes to note the changes in the heavens. An illusion good enough to fool them might not be enough to do the same today Ksvim said I guess it's worth a try Zoyan said dubiously. Though I'm honestly kind of skeptical that will go anywhere. I'm pretty sure you can't just isolate our planet from the rest of the celestial bodies without breaking everything horribly and killing us all in the process. There has to be a limit somewhere Ksvim said. I'll talk to the couple of astronomers I know and see what they tell me. In the meantime, make a note somewhere to include the spirit world severance factoid in your list the next time you try to convince me that the time loop is real. It should do wonders for your credibility. Also, make sure to sign the list with this. Ksvim took out a slip of paper from his pocket and handed it to him. Written on it in neat, perfect writing was a long string of letters and numbers. The whole thing was completely random and nonsensical as far as Zoyan could tell some kind of coded message. Zoyan mused out loud something similar. I've made a lot of contingencies over the years, including ones for when I expect to have my memories edited against my will and want to send messages to my future self Ksvim said, surprising Zoyan. That was, quite paranoid. And also a good idea he should probably make his own version of that. You will have to memorize the whole thing perfectly for this to work if even a single number or letter is out of place, the whole thing is ruined. Zoyan took several seconds to commit the code to his memory and then immediately created a memory packet around it, permanently preserving it for flawless recall in the future done he said, handing the slip of paper back to Ksvim. What now? Based on the various adventure novels Zoyan had read as a child, he kind of expected Ksvim to promptly burn the paper slip in his hand to prevent it from coming into the wrong hands. But no. Ksvim just put it back into his pocket and gave Zoyan a searching look. Disappointing that, Mr. Kaczynski, is something that I should be asking you Ksvim said. I was originally worried that you might be an imposter and that you might have been editing my memories. Regardless of whether or not you really are a time traveler, you have effectively put those fears to rest. Truthfully, I have no right to demand anything more from you. What now, indeed? Well, you are technically my mentor and you're supposed to advise me about how to develop my magic Zoyan tried, hoping that Ksvim would actually do his job properly for once. He was curious how Ksvim's teaching looked when he was not putting his charges through some messed up dedication test unfortunately, this is probably not the best time for that. I would need to thoroughly test your skills to see how I can best help you and I've kept you away from your morning classes for too long as it is said Ksvim. I should have something ready for you when we meet again on Friday. Not another batch of shaping exercises, I hope. Zoyan couldn't help but asking no Ksvim said, smiling slightly at the question. While I definitely intend to correct any obvious deficiencies in your magic base and raise your shaping skills to acceptable levels, I'm actually thinking of advancing your dimensionalism studies as far as they can go. 
that is, after all, the magical field that deals with things like time manipulation, which makes it uniquely relevant to your situation. It is a hard and demanding field of study, but if you could endure several years of my trials and keep coming, you doubtlessly have the required patience to succeed at it. Ha! Huh. That actually sounded kind of nice. The first part sounded a little ominous, but he would reserve judgment until he actually saw what that entailed in practice. He didn't actually mind the idea of being taught some shaping exercises, so long as Ksvim didn't resort to the same frustrating grind that he had employed in the past, and actually explained to Zoyan how he was supposed to go about performing the exercise. In any case, the meeting was very much finished at this point, so Zoyan said his goodbyes and left Ksvim's office. It was probably the first time he had ever left that place feeling better than he had when he entered it break over the next few days, the aftereffect of Zoyan's failed campaign against the burning apex web gradually faded away, leaving him completely healed. Kyle was still poring over his necromancy books and tinkering with some kind of spell item he was building, and refused to talk to Zoyan about Sudamir. He claimed he was pursuing a lead and that he would discuss things with him when he was ready. Zoyan had a feeling that Kyle was a little annoyed with him over his handling of the soul trap reveal but he really couldn't think of what he could have done so much better. Maybe Kyle didn't like that Zoyan had waited so long to break the news to him. On the other hand, Tyvan had reacted much better when he had told her about the time loop this time. She was a lot more receptive to the idea if he didn't wait for her to have a breakdown before telling her. All in all, the recovery period was a bit boring and Zoyan found himself searching for something to pass the time with. Just for fun, he recreated Kirill's drawings that he had stored in his mind and showed them to her. She frowned a lot while inspecting them, especially at the ones that clearly depicted the interior of Imaya's house and its inhabitants, but she did not seem willing to claim them as her own work. Instead, she criticized the technique of whoever drew them and suggested improvement, which amused him. She then asked him where he got them, and was annoyed at him when he insisted that he conjured them fully formed out of his head, which was also amusing. Somehow, the resulting argument led to Kirill giving him an impromptu drawing lesson and Zoyan was bored enough at the time to go along with it. According to Kirill, he was actually decent at drawing, which surprised him. She even claimed he could get as good as she was if he was willing to work on it. Considering how swamped with everything he always was, he doubted he would ever find the time for something like that. Then again, perhaps he could use an actual hobby, it was during one of those slow days that Zoyan went to the Academy Library in search of a book that talked about Eldamar's internal politics. Partly because he couldn't shake off the feeling that Sudamir's offhand comment about how he was working with the invaders because of politics wasn't completely false, and partly because his recent musings about how Sreed made him realize just how rudimentary his knowledge about Eldamar's power structures really was. He doubted he would really find an answer as to what Sudamir was referring to, but it probably wouldn't hurt to educate himself a little on the issue. In theory, Eldamar's internal situation was relatively simple. The country was a monarchy, with the power of the crown kept in check by a council of elders a gathering of nobles that were ostensibly supposed to advise the monarch and help them govern the country efficiently. The seats were hereditary, each held by a different noble house. That was why they were noble they had a seat on the council of elders, and were thus involved in the direct governing of the country. A regular house, while usually afforded a fair amount of special privileges and autonomy, did not have a say in how the country as a whole was run. Of course, reality was far more convoluted than that. The Crown and the Council of Elders clashed all the time, the houses routinely overstepped their bounds if they thought they could get away with it. Organizations like the Midge Guild and the Holy Triumvirate Church wielded considerable influence of their own, and powerful independent actors tried to play all sides for their own benefit. And that was not even getting into the issue of semi autonomous entities like the Shifter Tribes or the Free Port of Luya. Basically, the matter was complicated, and Zoyan's initiative didn't accomplish all that much. He was just about to give up and go home when he stumbled upon Tanami. Or rather, 
she stumbled upon him he was stationary, with his back turned to her, and the only reason he knew she was there was that he could recognize her mind through long exposure to her during previous restarts. He was content to ignore her at first, pretending he didn't know she was there, but since she was sufficiently curious to look over his shoulder to see what he was reading, he decided to say hello in the end hello, to Nami he said, not bothering to turn around. She immediately jerked back in surprise at the words. Ha! Huh. Surprise successful. Taking care to wipe the smile off his face, Zoyan turned around to face the girl. It was only polite to look at someone when you were talking to them, after all. Is there something I can help you with? Eh no, sorry she said, stumbling for a moment but recovering her composure quickly. I was just curious about what you were reading. And I just have to ask, splinter of splinters. Really, Zoyan? That's kind of, she paused for a moment, clearly searching for a polite term to use why would you ever read such trash, she finished eventually. Zoyan looked at the book in his hands. He hadn't noticed anything too bad in the book thus far, though admittedly he wouldn't call it good, either. Frankly. The only reason he was idly reading through it was because one of the other books he had already read and liked listed it among its sources I'm trying to find out an answer to a political question, but I know very little about politics Zoyan answered honestly. So I'm mostly just reading things at random, leafing through whatever book catches my attention. He placed Splinter of Splinters back on the shelf. The book was boring as hell anyway what kind of topic are you looking for? Tanami asked him I'm trying to find out a political reason why someone would want to burn Seoria to the ground Zoyan told her bluntly. Hypothetically speaking, of course. Are we talking about external or internal forces? Tanami asked, completely unperturbed by his admission internal Zoyan clarified. I'm pretty sure the number of external enemies that want the same is numberless. Not really, no Tanami said. Seoria supplies critical products to the entire continent. I think only Suleiman and a handful of others would be glad to see it completely gone. What about Alkar and Ibasa? asked Zoyan curiously them. Tanami scoffed. Who cares what they want? They can't do anything to us except raid our shipping. And as long as Eldamar controls Fort Oracle, even that is just a minor nuisance. Zoyan hummed non-committedly. He couldn't really fault Tanami for that logic, since he would have likely said something similar before he had experienced the invasion and found out who was behind it fair enough he said. So what I'm getting from all of this is that you know a thing or two about politics, yes. I am an heir of one of the noble houses Tanami shrugged. I'm required to know this sort of stuff. So yes, I suppose I do. Excellent. Then. Do you think you can recommend me a book about Eldamar's internal politics that isn't? Trash, as you say, he asked her. He expected her to either say no or give him a title or two to look for. What he did not expect was for her to drag him across the library for over 15 minutes in search of something that met his exact criteria. By the time Tanami was done suggesting things to him, he'd ended up with three different books one of which was a huge scary tome that made Zoyan sleepy just looking at it. He was starting to think he had made just a tiny bit of a mistake when he had asked her for help in this matter sorry, I went a little overboard Tanami apologized, sounding honestly apologetic it's fine Zoyan sighed. Though I'll be honest with you I really doubt I'm going to read all of this. He shook the stack of books in his hands for emphasis if you must pick one of the three to read, read Time of Tribulations Tanami told him. Oh good, that wasn't the big one. That's the important one. The Splinter Wars and the Weeping completely rearranged the political landscape everywhere in Altasia, but especially in Eldamar. Without understanding what aftershocks they caused and how countries dealt with them, you will never really understand Eldamar's politics. I see Zoyan said quietly. That did make a lot of sense the Splinter Wars essentially created Eldamar in its current form, and the weeping actually originated from Eldamar. Nobody at the time realized just how dangerous it was, in the early days of its spread, so it had significant effects on the country. 
It would be surprising if those two events hadn't changed things greatly. I guess it has something to do with the significant death toll of mags those two caused. Sort of Tanami said. It has to do with replacing them. Before the Splinter Wars, far more mags belonged to an established house or had at least one midge parent. First generation mags like yourself were, well, not rare exactly, but far less common than they are now. After the Splinter Wars and the Weeping, though, a lot of those houses and families went extinct or bankrupt, unable to deal with the chaos of the times or the loss of critical members. The last thing Eldemar wanted to do was downscale their operations due to lack of mags, so somebody had to replace the dead. The result was a lot of first-generation mags flooding the magical market in previously unseen numbers. So? Zoyan asked. I guess I'm a little biased, being a civilian-born student myself, but why is that a problem? Not a problem as such, no Tanami said carefully. But it definitely changed the politics of the country beyond recognition. First-generation mags are educated and supported by the Midge Guild, and by extension the Crown of Eldemar. When houses and other autonomous groups clash with the Crown, first-generation mags overwhelmingly side with the Crown. The influx of civilian-born mags helped Eldemar bounce back from the Splinter Wars and weeping incredibly quickly, but it also strengthened royal power and made the Midge Guild far more important than it used to be, and that scares a lot of factions. Interesting Zoyan hummed thoughtfully. How does that relate to Seoria and people who want to see it burn, though? Well, Seoria is absolutely critical for first-generation mags who want to make it big Tanami said. Most other mana wells have sharp limits on the amount of mana they produce, and thus have tight regulations about who can perform what magical business in the area. They're usually controlled by some established group or even a house, and aren't very friendly to newcomers unless they are willing to become someone's underlings. The hole, on the other hand, spews incomprehensibly vast amounts of mana into the air every single second. Far more than anyone could really use up. There is never a shortage of ambient mana in Seoria, so nobody cares about how many mana forges, research facilities and various other facilities are built in the city. Unsurprisingly, the city is absolutely flooded with first-generation mags, which makes it a major loyalist stronghold. It's so important to the central government, politically speaking, that some people call it the second national capital. Anyone who has an axe to grind against either the Crown or the Midge Guild might want to see it gone. Though I rather suspect that anyone expressing the desire to see it literally burned to the ground is just being overdramatic. Our external political situation is sufficiently dangerous that no one really wants to weaken the nation too much, and Seoria is both a major population center and a magical powerhouse. So, what I'm getting from your explanation is that people who most want to see Seoria gone probably come from various houses that dislike their historical importance being eroded Zoyan said. Sadly, that didn't explain Sudamir's remark as far as Zoyan could tell he had no idea whether Sudamir was a first generation midge, but he definitely wasn't a part of a house. But the thing is, there are plenty of houses, even noble houses who have their headquarters stationed here. Yours, for example. Or House Novda. Not every house likes every other Tanami shrugged. There are plenty of them that would hold a celebration if every Aop spontaneously died in their sleep. Ouch but it's funny you would mention the Novdas. You know what happened to them, right? They all died except Zak Zoyan said immediately yes, and then the crown placed Tussan's Vry as Zak's caretaker, and he sold off nearly everything they owned to his friends and associates for pocket change while paying himself a huge caretaker fee. Few people will outright say so, but the man basically looted the entire house of everything they had. And the Novda were very, very wealthy Tanami explained. If Zack wasn't such an idiot, I'd imagine he'd be extremely bitter about the city authorities that were complicit in the deed. I could totally imagine myself wishing for Seoria to burn down to ashes, if I were in his place. At least on an emotional level. How you know Zoyan said. I think I want to hear more about that story. 